Hey everybody, it's Rishi Agarwal, and in this video, we're going to do a thoracic radiology border view. Um, in this video, I'm going to show a series of 10 questions, and I'm going to spend 10 seconds on each question, which is not that much time. So please pause the video, examine the image or images until you have the answer, and then resume the video. And at the end of all 10 questions, I'm going to come back to the beginning and review all the answers and give you a few key pearls. Okay, let's start. Okay, let's return to question one. So on this question, we have a patient who has a frontal chest radiograph and they have an abnormal hazy opacity in the left hemithorax here, as well as decreased volume on the left side. And that's manifest by an elevation of the left hemidiaphragm. We have ribs that are close together and also what's called a juxtaphrenic peak on this side. Um, also notably, we have a lucency that is between the aortic arch and this opacity. And this is a sign of, these are all signs of left upper lobe collapse. I didn't show you the lateral view because I think it's gettable just on the frontal view, but here is the lateral view. What we have on the lateral is a homogeneous opacity with a very sharp margin in the anterior part of the chest. Okay, and these are all classic signs of left upper lobe collapse. So in an outpatient setting, the next thing to do is to get a chest CT because we're looking for an obstructing lesion. So some corollary questions that you could get in this example are, what are what's the most common inpatient cause, which would be mucus plugging. Outpatient cause, we would think about lung cancer. The sign, which is that lucency between the aorta and the opacity, is called the Luftsickel sign, or air sickle. And another sign of upper lobe collapse is the juxtaphrenic peak sign. The juxtaphrenic peak sign is this part of the diaphragm that pokes up, and that's something that you get whenever there's upper lobe collapse. So in this case, there's left upper lobe collapse, so we have a left juxtaphrenic peak, but you can have a right juxtaphrenic peak with a right upper lobe collapse. So the low bar collapses are something that you should know because the lobes collapse in very predictable ways. This is a right upper lobe collapse with an S sign of golden because of a central mass. And this is what right upper lobe collapse with a central mass looks like 
from one patient to the next patient. This is a right middle lobe and right lower lobe collapse secondary to a mucus plug in the bronchus intermedius. And so if you don't know the patterns of lobar collapse, this is something that you should review because I think it is fair game for uh, the boards. Okay, let's look at question two. This is most likely to present with what, and the question was referring to this mass here in the right lateral aspect of the hemithorax. And this turns out to be a solitary fibrous tumor, and it is associated with certain perineoplastic syndromes, which are HPOA, or hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, and hypoglycemia. Uh, the differential for a pleural mass includes metastatic disease, mesothelioma, and sarcoma. And the percentage of solitary fibrous tumors that are malignant range between 10 to 30 percent. Okay, so this brings up an important point. The perineoplastic syndromes, there are many, many perineoplastic syndromes that are associated with different tumors, but I think these are probably the ones that are fair game for a board review. These are the ones that are listed in um, the web book. So I think these are the ones to know. Okay, question three. So I showed you a chest x-ray and a coronal chest CT. And on the chest x-ray, first of all, looking at the mediastinum, we have fullness in the AP window region. In the lungs, we have bilateral perihilar masses. They have sort of an irregular shape, and they're heterogeneous. There's some areas of high density within them. And then in the periphery of the lung, we have some reticulonodular opacities. On the CT, we see the masses again. We see the calcification within the masses, and it looks like there's architectural distortion and speculation surrounding these masses. We also see tiny nodules at the periphery of the masses. So the answer to this one is sarcoid, and what we're looking at is a specific form of sarcoid called progressive massive fibrosis. So the differential for progressive massive fibrosis includes four things, sarcoid, silicosis, co-workers pneumoconiosis, and talcosis. Talcosis is probably the least common of those. So what is progressive massive fibrosis? Really, it represents a coalition of multiple small nodules into a big mass, and that mass is associated with fibrosis. So you'll see traction bronchiectasis, or you see architectural distortion associated with it. So this is a case similar to the one I just showed you. This is secondary to silicosis. This one is due to co-workers pneumoconiosis. Um, you can have areas of necrosis within the progressive massive fibrosis. It can be hot on PET like in this example, and you can see it on MR as well. So it's going to be isoda low on T1 and hypo intense on T2. Okay, question four. On this question, I showed you two coronal images of the chest, and one is on lung windows showing you a large hyperlucent area in the right lower lung, and within this, there's a paucity of vessels. We have a lot fewer vessels or pruning of the vessels, and then in the center of it, there's this large branching structure, and on soft tissue windows, you could see that this branching structure is hypodense, so it's not, it doesn't have contrast in it. So the question was, what is this hypodense structure? And the answer is A, a mucus-filled bronchus. And this is a case of bronchial atresia. And what bronchial atresia is, is simply an area of the tracheobronchial tree that does not communicate back to the central trachea and bronchus. Um, but it usually pushes the normal lung aside, and the classic appearance is an uh, area of hyperlucent lung with a central mucus plug. And if you look carefully on thin images, you will find that you cannot connect the bronchi in this area of lung back to the central tracheobronchial tree. Question five. So I showed you two images of the chest in this patient, and one is a chest x-ray showing a large area of calcification in the AP window. And then you also see that there's a lot of reticulation in the paramediastinal parts of the, of the lung, right? On the right side and the left side. On the CT, you could see that this uh, area is indeed calcified. And these look like lymph nodes, actually. And these are calcified lymph nodes, except that they're very large. So the past history of this patient is prior radiation, and this represents treated lymphoma. Each of these other answer choices corresponds with another 
type of lung disease, spelunking goes along with histoplasmosis. So you can see calcified lymph nodes in the mediastinum from histo, but usually the lymph nodes will not be this big and you won't have the accompanying paramediastinal radiation fibrosis. Sandblasting is an occupation that goes along with silicosis and pipe fitting is an occupation that goes along with asbestos related lung disease. So which of these shows calcification? These are all diseases that you can have in the mediastinum. Which of them will show calcification? You can choose more than one. So the answer is actually all of them can show calcification except for lymphoma unless it's treated lymphoma, in which case that can also be calcified as I just showed you. Question six, what is this person's occupation? So this person is an insulator because they were exposed, exposed to asbestos. And what we have here on the chest x-ray are well demarcated, calcified areas of opacity in both lungs. Actually, they're not in the lungs, they're in the pleura. And this has what is sometimes referred to as a holly leaf pattern because we have a, sort of a dip and then a straight area and then a dip again uh, and then a straight area, sort of like a holly leaf. And so this person is, um, is exposed to asbestos. These other uh, answer choices refer to other occupational lung diseases. So a farmer is usually referring to hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Beekeepers are red herring. There's no occupational lung disease. Sandblaster, again, so silicosis. Insulator or pipe fitter or brake pads or shipyard, that's asbestos. Uh, millinery is, is mercury poisoning from back in the olden days, so you get a neurodegenerative disease. Okay, question seven. What is the diagnosis here? So the diagnosis is C. non-tuberculous mycobacterium. So the findings here are areas of mucus plugging. We have a little bronchial wall thickening, maybe a little bronchiectasis as well, as well as what we call tree in bud opacity. So tree in bud opacity just means mucus plugging in distal airways, and it is in a characteristic pattern. So we have the most disease in the right middle lobe and in the lingula. And this is a classic pattern of disease in non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. Notice there's also some disease in the lower lobes. Question eight. This is associated with what? The answer here is C, complete cartilaginous tracheal ring. And what this is, is uh, here's the aorta. This is the main pulmonary artery, and we have the right pulmonary artery coming this way. But then we have another artery that comes off of the right, and it goes between the trachea and the esophagus, and this is what is known as a pulmonary sling. And pulmonary slings are associated with complete cartilaginous tracheal rings. It's the, quote, uh, rings and slings association, okay? So these other things are associated with um, other uh, anomalies. So an aberrant right subclavian artery is associated with a right aortic arch. The same for mirror image branching, that's associated with a right aortic arch. Uh, sinus venosus ASD is associated with partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Question nine. So this, this was two questions. The first one was a left lung cancer. What is the nodal staging? So what we have here is a cancer in the left lung. I didn't show you where, but you have lymph node here, and then you also have a subcarinal lymph node. So really the question was getting at what is a subcarinal lymph node classified as? And then the corollary question was this one, what is the nodal staging here? So we had a left lung cancer, what is the nodal staging for a left supraclavicular lymph node? And all you have to do is refer to your nodal staging for lung cancer. And so the subcarinal lymph node refers to an N2, whereas a supraclavicular lymph node refers to an N3. Okay, so just to review, N0 means you don't have any large lymph nodes. N1, the same side peribronchial and hilar. N2 is the same side of the mediastinum or subcarinal. And then N3 is the other mediastinum, the other hilum, or either one of the right or left supraclavicular lymph nodes. Finally, question 10. 
which is most likely to cause hoarseness? And the answer is this one over here, because we have a lymph node that is obstructing or impeding the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. So remember that from anatomy, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve comes off of the vagus nerve, which descends in the mediastinum, and then it branches off of the uh, vagus, comes underneath the aortic arch, and then ascends up to supply the left vocal cord. The right does a similar thing, except rather than looping under the aortic arch, it loops underneath the right subclavian artery. Okay, so that's all the cases for this time. If you have any questions about any of these cases, feel free to email me, and my email address is on the About page of this channel, or you can leave a comment here and I'll try to get to it. Thanks.